Our next guest, speaking of Japan, says that equity markets in Japan, along with Russia and Thailand, make sense to him. He also says the commod sell-off is a buying opportunity. Joining us here in Hong Kong is Dr. V. Anantha Nagas Warren, Chief Investment Officer at Bank Julius Bayer, and our guest host, Mikio from LGT Capital Management in Singapore. Van, welcome to the show. Good to see you Thank here you. in Hong Kong. Uh, are you sure? About this commod thing, that it's a that, that it's a buying opportunity. I mean, I look at silver, which really led yeah. the, uh, the the nutty rally last time, and it's just sitting there at about thirty five. No, I think uh, that is uh, likelihood of a long period of consolidation, no doubt. But I think uh, if you look at the fact that real interest rates worldwide are going to remain negative for quite some time, not just in the U.S. but elsewhere. That is usually a very important ingredient of, uh, uh, of risky asset rally, and commodities are one of them. Mm -hmm. And then you have fundamental factors like you know global climate change and massive uh, uh, dry period in Western Europe at the moment going on. And uh, you have Middle East tensions, supply uh, constraints and concerns. So I think if you take them all together, and along with the fact that monetary policy will remain exceptionally loose worldwide, mm -hmm. I think this sell-off constitutes a buying opportunity. Mm -hmm. When you you know you you cite the cheap cost of money, but that is a that is a moving target uh, nowadays. Obviously, in Asia, we know very well that central banks are, uh, you know, very much on inflation watch. We've even got you know the St. Louis Fed uh, president mm -hmm. here, uh, Bullard, James Bullard. He's been one of the biggest talk voices uh, there, talking about maybe the perhaps the uh, yeah. desire to it start in, uh, indexing inflation. No, but I think he is a, he's a bull on, on growth. That's, that's the key. But I think the Federal Reserve doesn't necessarily share his optimism on growth in the U.S. itself. I think uh, if you look at the Chicago Fed National Activity Index that came out last night, mm -hmm. that was slightly on the, on the weaker side. And if you look at the recent run of data, they have been on the disappointing side. Not just on the housing side, but also on you know technology spending and so on. So I'm not sure that when you come to the end of QE2 in June, mm -hmm. that there wouldn't be a reason for the Federal Reserve to keep it going in some guise or the other. Mm -hmm. Van, say hi to Singapore. Hi. Yeah, Dr. Van, hi. Uh, help me figure this out. You know, I, I looked at two things uh, overnight. We have the 10-year yield at one point, it dipped below 310, it did uh, 309, yet Fed funds futures now, they're ratcheting up expectations of an interest rate hike. So what's going on there? Well, I think, it is, in my view, the, the expectations of rate hikes on the Fed fund future side seems to be quite misplaced. I can understand the 10-year Treasury rallying below 3.1% because I think recent run of that has been exceptionally soft. And there certainly there are concerns about whether the first quarter growth slowdown was a blip or was the beginning of a slowdown. And therefore, I feel that expectations of any rate hike in the U.S. in the course of 2011 or well into 2012 are very premature. Mikio, do you think it's a 2012 or a 2011 story, interest rate hikes? A rate hike is a 2012 rate hike, yes. Why so far out then? Well, because there is a lot of things they can do before that. Um, you know, we had this extraordinary unorthodox measures, which is basically um, buying the, the Treasury securities. So the first step, I think, would be stop reinvesting and see how that w works out. The current expectation of a rate hike is, I think, the market's nervousness and uneasiness because they sense that something is changing. But for all practical purposes, the first thing they're going to do is stop reinvesting proceeds and then they're going to be, uh, give, maybe consider a rate hike. So that's, that's some t time, time uh, off. Yeah. Let me bring it back to Hong Kong here in Van. And specifically with your prescription, I found it curious, the trio of uh, equity cap markets which you find uh, desirable right now, Japan, yeah. Russia, Thailand. You couldn't, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't drum up three more disparate, unrelated markets I for different reasons. I that, suppose that's good news, isn't it, for diversification. I think Japan, I, I must say that Japan has been somewhat disappointing because the Bank of Japan, after the crisis, has uh, did push up liquidity, but since then has been busy withdrawing liquidity. And mm -hmm. I expected them to keep liquidity in the system. Not very aggressive, huh? They have mm -hmm. not been aggressive, but yeah. if anything, uh, Mr. Shirakawa was talking about the risk of bubbles in Japan, and I just couldn't understand uh, the, the logic of that. So I'm still hoping that push comes to a show, they are going to be uh, forced into maintaining the liquidity or jacking it back up. Mm -hmm. So, and certainly valuations are in Japanese equities favor. In the case of Thailand, I think they have let the currency appreciate, they have been rising interest rates, mm -hmm. and they're very confident about their credit growth. And I think the elections in July would right. basically bring an end to the political uncertainty, mm -hmm. and Russia still remains an energy proxy. Okay. Thank you. 
What is your uh, general view, Van? Hello. Um, what is your general view on, on Asia, though, uh, as a region relative to the, uh, you know, there is a discussion developed versus emerging economies, Asia versus uh, maybe the more traditional Western markets such as the U.S. or, or Europe? I think personally I feel um, emerging markets underperformance uh, is over. I think uh, the valuations are not unreasonable now. Certainly you wouldn't call them cheap, but certainly you wouldn't call them overpriced. And uh, MSCI Asia X Japan's uh, price to book ratio is well below the last 7 to 10 years uh, average. And some markets are beginning to look long term interesting. Certainly I think uh, if you look at markets like China and also India after recent correction, I think they are beginning to look interesting for the long term players. But those who are concerned about the monthly uh, red numbers in their, in their statements, asset statements, should probably wait. But Asia for long term investors is beginning to look interesting. Okay, let me come full circle then. If, you're, uh, if you still think that this whole commodity sell off that we saw a few weeks ago is a signal to buy. Uh, would Glencore be the way to do that, or is that too murky a uh, Well, no, I would personally, name. I always prefer you know, physical uh, uh, exposure rather than uh, through proxy, through corporates. Uh-huh. Yeah. Especially that's, uh, that's involved in so many things in so many parts of the world, it's hard to leverage. I think it? it's good yeah. to go to the real source of your risk and return rather than uh, doing it through proxy if it is possible, and I think it's possible in commodities. Yeah. All right. Ben, good to have you here in Hong Kong, okay? Thank you, Welcome buddy. once again. Better keep dry. I enjoy uh, mid the moisture here.